Hey, what's up, YouTube? Uh, so, thank you for watching. This is Killing for Company. My name's Kellen, and today we're just talking about some CDs. I've uh, done a few of these updates about uh, vinyl, and so just wanted to share some of the CDs that I've got in my collection here as of late. Um, while we're on it in the background, turn this up a little bit. We're listening to the Evangelic through set two. I believe that's the correct pronunciation. Uh, Italian brutal death metal. Let's see if that distracts from this video at all, but we'll get through it. Okay, so CD update. And uh, first one I got for you today. So this is a project called uh, BC or BC. I'm not sure about how you say that. It's a Polish project, and this uh, album is entitled Transatonism. Um, believe it out of Krakow. So BC plays a brand of black metal. I would. I think it's fair to call it black metal. Um, that's sort of explicitly tied to electronic music in a way that you don't usually hear in black metal. Um, primarily just because it's such a focal point of the sound. It doesn't play like a peripheral ambient role within the band. Um, to call it like dance electronic, it would probably be an overstatement, but uh, it's it's not your usual sort of secondary contribution. So there's a whole lot to unpack here. Um, so this is a second full length, this was on Gods of War, and um, given the sort of electronic piece to this project, Another sort of component is the idea of it like being in urban or like downtown city nightlife, uh, 21st century Krakow, Poland band. What I mean by that is, um, I remember watching a video uh, by, uh, over at Eric Bauer's channel. I think it was like, you know, one of those response videos, like 20 albums that got me into black metal. And he made a point that was interesting, which is he grew up in mostly larger city environments. And so the idea that you'd be listening to a black metal release and uh, caught up in sort of like wandering in, through nature, experiencing that sort of like meditative, meditative relationship with like a forest or a mountainside, um, for someone who was growing up and living in the city, for him it just didn't make sense. So a lot of his black metal choices had to do with like uh, bands that were not speaking to that kind of narrative within the genre. And BC is definitely taking sort of that idea, or that concept of that what does nightlife look like in a major modern city and um, sort of channeling that identity through a black metal um, project, there's a whole other piece of this, which is, a, I don't know if you can pick that up there in the camera, um, where it's like a uh, personality, the, the, sort of the lead vocalist, it's mostly, um, or I should say, is a one uh, member band, if you want to call it that, this uh, Fastia IHS Moreau is the character that, you know, presides over BC and, um, you know, you look at that album artwork and you know it's into some different kind of black metal. Uh, it absolutely caught my eye and there's like a drag um, queen performance aspect to this. Um, you can, you know, you, you got like the bullet belt bandolier thing, but this crazy um, 
big blue hair and pale, you know, sort of, it's not corpse paint, right? But it, it takes that sort of ethos and say like, that is tired. Um, what does it mean to be a black metal musician with sort of a performative alter identity in the 21st century that's not like tired and played out? Um, and it just takes that concept uh, to a whole new sort of uh, place that you're not you're used to seeing in the genre. Um, that's and because that is a whole lot to explain and unpack. I think people who are looking for more men orthodox black metal listen. This is not going to be something you like, but um, it stood out this year for me and. It is like an extreme metal listen, but you have to sort of take into consideration all those factors when you think about what black metal means to a modern audience today. And um, this is a good job sort of addressing that in a way that does not fe seem like they're trying to sensationalize the subject matter or exploit some um, niche identity. Like, it, it, it seems like a holistic artistic vision and from the presentation and the artwork to the whole like you know performance outfit get up um, to the sound you hear on the record it, it's a, a collective vision and uh, a really interesting black metal release um, which ultimately is what I would call it uh, here in, in the past you know 2020 so um, you know, here's the back in there, BC, Trans-Satanism. Uh, I think, so it was originally released through Gods of War on CD, um, but I think it is getting a vinyl pressing, so a really, um, you know, for your fans of like, not just, you know, modern or more adventurous or electronic um, black metal, but like almost speaks to a little bit of that like black metal industrial sound that was happening. Um, and just taking it to a whole new world, so. Um, next up here, I got, man, so, uh, Pestifer, or Pestifer, um, from Belgium, a technical death metal band. Um, what do I wanna say? So I've been listening to for about over a decade now, and they first came on the came on my radar about 2010. I think was their first full length. And I'm gonna like have my little like old man uh, sour grapes death metal moment. But back in 2010, 2009, um, there was not this larger conversation about or generational push towards old school death metal like that just was not a thing at the time and it was you know to be fair um it would be in the subsequent years that the terminology ended up sort of gaining momentum um horrendous uh morbus prawn you know uh bastum those bands were sort of on their way and getting things started, and I mean, Pestifier plays in a way that anyone who's a fan of older death metal bands from the '90s, you know, will recognize, but not in the same with the same kind of shorthand. So when most people will use that those terms, um, they're specifically referring to like a handful of bands, right? Like they're, they're talking about like Entombed. Autopsy, Incantation, um, Bolt Thrower, and Demolin, right? Like, it, it's it, within that sort of vein, people are throwing together these terms like old school death metal. But like, no one mentions Nocturnus, right? And if you look at this, um, which is an older 90s death metal band that's playing technical death metal and it is a major influence on the like Pest of Fear logo. Anyone who knows Nocturnus will look at the Pestifier logo and recognize that silhouette. And that this band, you know, is definitely paying, whoop, 
paying homage to that kind of uh, heritage. Um, very cool technical death metal in that vein, though. So it sounds like 90s death metal, but you know, for a band that started, in, for the most part, you know, at the end of 2010, a little bit, you know, before that. Um, so I would call this old school death metal, but not in the way that's like, oh, remember Skeptic from Poland? And they were doing like technical death metal, like that. Um, it, it, it just, is a, it's interesting to think about it. You know, because I play this and I would say old school death metal, no one thinks, you know, that kind of sound. Um, it's, uh, those, the songs are not too sprawling. They're all around that like five to six minute time, uh, minute length and range. The instruments um, are uh, produced well enough to, to where you can separate them and recognize the kind of musicianships that's at play. Um, but at the same time, it retains a little bit of that 90s or nostalgia sound. Uh, it's never too complex um, and whatever sort of uh, intricate musicianship is at hand, it's usually um, employed with a degree of economy that never gets too overwhelming. So you, know, you get like these little complex riffs or leads that splinter off for a little bit, but it never becomes sort of uh, uh, anything that would turn someone off in terms of the amount of musicianship that's um, going on. The, the, the leads are not, you know, whatever you want to call it. Like, it's not like Aimee Malmsteen wankery is sort of the term. Um, gosh, I hate that term. Can we find a different term for that? Um, it's not bloated. Maybe it's a better way to describe it. Um, it it's not forced. This band has been at it for you know over a decade now, and loves technical death metal in, in an old style. It's not caught up in any of the trends that are happening now. It never fell into the like technical death metal that also required a degree of brutality. The uh, production style still feels um, you know nostalgic and. Uh, Remember sort of a forgotten era of death metal. Um, it occurs before everything became uh, sort of defined by what Cryptopsy was doing. Um, it, it's a, a absolute, you know, this I did not get a lot of attention and I get because it's, you know, not a cool thing necessarily that's happening right now. But if you love, you know, some of the mans that I mentioned, like Nocturnus, um, check this out. Uh, you know, the Aura album that I mentioned in a previous video sounds a bit more like now in terms of generation. This is just paying homage to a style that is not often heard um, in, in today's death metal conversation. So, um, has to fear. Um, Expanding Oblivion is the title, and uh, Xenocarp is the record label. Um, awesome stuff. Okay, next up. Payback, man. Um, so, just to kind of pull back a little bit, for everything that 2020 was, um, and uh, losing, you know, a band like Power Trip, um, it, it felt a year like like a year that needed a definitive sort of politically charged thrash album to me. Um, I was missing that, and I don't think we got enough of that from the thrash metal community. At least I didn't feel that way. Um, in a way that like spoke to you know my tastes, my preferences, and um, as much as you can you can talk about a band like Power Trip, and you know maybe that's not your thing. I, I felt Nightmare Logic was sort of defining piece in sort of the past decade of uh, thrash um, influenced metal releases. And, I, and it was a year that I thought had everything, you know, 
worked out. Um, you know, unfortunately it didn't, but um, it's just incredibly sad. But it was one of those, like, where are they in this conversation? At this time in history, we need that kind of a record to be released. And this is Payback Padecer, I believe is the pronunciation. I speak some Spanish, uh, not so much uh, Portuguese. And they are from Belo, Hello, Belo Horizonte, I think is the correct pronunciation, um, in Brazil. Look at this album artwork. You know, I was talking about, like, um, I don't, I'm hoping that's going to be able to focus in and see that. But um, that was basically this year in a nutshell. And um, Payback uh, are playing, you know, a mix of, yes, thrash, but also like there's elements of um, crust in the sense that you get like that punk to crust to death metal, like either some like lower end guttural like bellowing going on here. It's definitely like a crossover record. Um, so you get all of those sort of thrash and thrash adjacent genres going on. You know, Sacred Rite, um, Holy Terror, uh, Discharge, um, all of those things are uh, on this, or a part of this sound. Um, Brazil's right now in you know, just the same kind of upheaval, <coughs> excuse me, that America's going through. Jair Bolsonaro is an absolute nightmare of a president. And, um, you know, the first track off of here, uh, Drowned in Mud, um, speaks to a natural disaster that happened um, due to in basically a uh, heavy rainfall, there was a dam that had been perfect, purchased by a private company called Vale and had let sort of standards in um, maintenance drop and the dam collapsed and there was a massive mudslide. People lost their lives, thousands of people were displaced from their homes. It was like considered an incredible natural disaster in Brazil and kind of spoke to the kind of um, environmental concerns that the country has along with the, a president who's an incredibly authoritarian sort of um, oppressive voice it, it just it, the context for this record was um, uh, spoke to um, what's happening right now in the world and it, it was it was the right kind of thrash album for me this year um, on Black Hole Productions, they've got a couple of videos up on YouTube, um, but uh, it be, being like, I don't think they got a whole lot of press, and I did not see this circulating a whole lot, um, probably just due to being on a smaller label in, in Brazil, but um, unlike a lot of Brazilian thrash, it's not so much focused on like the uh, black and thrash sort of thing that the country is known for. This is definitely, um, a bit more of like, you know, 1980s thrash crossover um, from America and really, really awesome record. Please check this out. Payback, how did I say it? Um, next up. Okay, so this is uh, Haunted Cenotaph, um, and they are a Polish band. Um, Bissel Menace is the album title. Um, so this was released on uh, Fallen Temple, and I got into this because uh, I remember um, I was kind of on the fence about picking up Eternal Rot. Um, they were just it was everything that I wanted in terms of like a super heavy, gross, disgusting, death doom record. Um, but they just had these like mid-paced, almost rock rhythms that I just could not get behind. And I, as badly as I wanted to like the their record this year, I just would get to a certain song when I was like, you know, do I, should I pull the trigger or not? And every single time, I, after trying to convince myself, I just couldn't do it. 
Um, but it was big, well-produced, nasty, like, gory death doom. Um, and so I kept on looking for something, and uh, I had read an interview where Eternal Rot recommended Haunted Cenotaph. Now, this is in, in kind of um, paradoxically, like, sounds in a lot of ways antithetical to Eternal Rot. Um, they, it's just not the same part of modern, thick, sloppy, wet production. Um, it sounds a bit uh, dialed back and like dry um, uh, by comparison. Um, it's, what's really interesting is that uh, it almost speaks to like a, um, because the vocals have this echoed effect, it's, it's like a, uh, a black metal contribution. Um, it's very much, uh, you know, the pieces, the building blocks to it are similar to Eternal Rock. It's, it's mid-paced, it's got some like groovy sections, but it, it just that small sort of fractional difference between the two of them. Uh, I, I, this was, I had no problems getting into this. Um, but it, you know, it, it's got a little bit of a different production quality. Um, it sounds a little bit sm uh, smaller by comparison, or older, nostalgic. It doesn't sound as modern. Um, but uh, a great um, record. I also did not. It was a phenomenal year for uh, that for Doom Death. But at the beginning of the year, you have. Uh, Worms Gloom Lord, which sort of dominates. I mean, that album was almost silent for the first two months, and then March, April, it picked up steam by the end of the year. I would say for most people that I saw, it was like one of their top ten. Um, so as a consequence, I think people caught up to that record and that dominated the subgenre in terms of the, the conversation. Whereas, like, Hot and Cenotaph, um, it just, just got Fallen Temple. Um, released it on CD, and then I think um, it got picked up for distribution in the States um, on tape. Uh, Redefining Darkness, I believe. Uh, picked it up for distribution in, in the States, so um, not the same kind of uh, fanfare, but it definitely sounds different, and it's... it's um, Polish and Swedish, you don't get the same sort of like finish appeal. So much of that like mid pace sort of rockier vibes. Um, but uh, interesting vocal, I think that plays like the, the centerpiece for the album is just a um, vocal that does like the low bellowing, but also has these like howls and screeches that echo off the walls. And um, that sort of like contributes to a little bit of a black metal flair simply to the, uh, the vocal quality. Um, it does, and the rest of it sounds very much Doom Death. It's not a black metal record by any means. It's just that one vocal piece um, has, you know, I think I saw an uh, initial review that it compared it to Treblinka, which is like not uh, a band that you typically hear associated with uh, Death Doom Max nowadays. So, um, on a cenotaph, if you want, you know, at this point in the year, if you're like kind of crossed off the main ones from the list and you have, you know, your um, picked up your copy of Worm uh, and you want something different, check out Haunted Cenotaph, really cool. Uh, last one I have for you today is uh, Evangelist. So this is in Latin. Ad Mortem Festinamus. Uh, I think this is also a Polish band. So I got three Polish records here for you. Uh, they play Epic Doom. Um, this also snuck in towards the end of the year in December. So, uh, I, there's like a handful of bands that I will keep an eye on that I hope to get releases from on an annual basis, but um, I, that does not happen. So, uh, at like the end of the year when I saw that they would be putting out some material, um, I just turned into an EP, but it's like an almost a 40 minute long EP, so nonetheless, um, almost worse as an LP for me. You get, uh, at the end of the year, at the end of the album, I should say, um, there's a Mystification cover by Manila Road. Um, on, they'd also done a single through, um, or they covered 
Mayhem's Freezing Moon. Uh, so they play in that space, sort of an understanding of um, epic metal from where, you know, at the beginning of the genre's inception and then something more sort of aggressive and extreme. You know, Mayhem's a, a black metal act, but um, you can tell the band members are sort of going through all those various influences before putting together an epic uh, Doom release. Uh, all the themes, you know, you've got, you know, stories of um, like traditional Lovecraft themes, but you also have like the Crusades and kind of like this interest between uh, a violent story of Christianity and medieval Europe. Um, just They've, they've got a full length that came out, I want to say, in 2018. And if you wanted a full LP, please go check that out. But this is an awesome EP. Um, and it's going to be... I, I know it's, we were talking about this on some of the live streams. The Lord Vigo is getting more attention, and that's like great. But Evangelist, to me, is more true, modern, epic doom than that. And uh, definitely was uh, worth the wait. Um, coming all the way from Poland for me, so it's going to be easier to get your hands on. I think you'll enjoy it more. Uh, so that's uh, Evangelist. And that's going to cap my CD update here for today. Uh, I'm going to see if I can get two of these knocked out for you um, on my day off. i got a bunch of stuff in this week. We had a crazy, you know, with the storm and everything coming across the country there was a massive delay in terms of mail delivery but it all arrived in like a single day so there's tons of stuff that came in the mail and uh, I'll have hopefully more content for you here very soon until then thanks for watching bye